<laughs> Good to see you. And you guys are standing out here on a Friday morning. You never gave me I want you to look at yourself. Because you are the continuum of history. You're the ones that tell me that this place matters. And this place matters particularly right now. Because you've made a special effort to put your lives on hold to be here this moment and stand on this land. All for one individual. One man. A major general named John Cedric. Cedric was a uh, fellow who was born in Cornwall Hollow, Litchfield County, Connecticut, in 1813. He was born at the height of the Napoleonic Wars. He was born when America was engaged in a war with Great Britain. He was born into a world of a warrior. He went to the United States Military Academy at West Point, graduated in the class of 1837, about the middle of his class. He was 24 <coughs> in a class of 50. He was not well remembered as a scholar, but he was remembered by his classmates as being a man who liked to laugh. Uh, his class had a number of luminaries that came out with him. Uh, among the Union hierarchy, Joseph Hooker was in that class. William Blinky French was in that class because he had a nervous tick in his eye and the army being such a caring, nurturing family <laughs> made that into his nickname. And um, from the Confederate stand, Jubal Early is graduating in that class. Braxton Bragg is in that class. John C. Pemberton is in that class. Now, when John Sedgwick graduated, he went straight into active service. And he saw a lot of service. He went straight from graduation to Florida and became engaged in the Seminole Wars. Uh, he was fighting his first action within a year of graduation at a place for, called Fort Press. Uh, later on, he is going to bounce around, going from fighting Seminoles to fighting Kiowas to fighting Cherokees to fighting uh, Comanches. Uh, he was going to be up on the Canadian border when we had disputes with them. Uh, he was going to be taking care of many forts all across uh, uh, the land from uh, Fortress Monroe, Fort McHenry in the east, off to Fort Riley in Kansas. Uh, during the Mexican War, he was in the artillery and did commendable service. He was brevet for gallantry, becoming a brevet captain during campaign uh, for fighting at Contreras and Cherubusco. Then he was breveted immediately afterwards, major, for his action at Chapultepec and fighting at the gates of Mexico City itself. Another artillerist that was breveted at the same time was named Thomas Jonathan Jackson. And he too was being addressed Major Jackson at the moment that Cedric became addressed Major Cedric. So they were kindred spirits in that way. In the War, or in the years leading up to the war, he was going to work with a number of folks who were going to go north and south. Uh, for example, in 1861, he was in charge of Fort Riley, Kansas. His adjutant was going to be the future Confederate cavalry commander, Lunsford L. Lomax. So everything signed by Sedgwick is countersigned by Lomax. The names appear side by side dozens and dozens of times. When the war broke out, and many Southern officers resigned. Sedgwick was jumping up the ladder quickly to fill holes. He was moved from Major to Lieutenant Colonel of the 2nd U.S. Cavalry. Who did he replace? Mm -hmm. He replaced Robert Edward Lee. Then he became the Colonel of the 1st U.S. Cavalry. And then he became Brigadier General U.S. Volunteers, with the fighting began. July 4th, 1862, he became a major general of U.S. Volunteers. He was wounded twice in action. He had been wounded during the Seven Days Battles around Richmond, shot at Glendale. At the very same time, another one of his friends and colleagues, George Gordon Meade, was shot. He recuperated just like Meade and bounced back and was 
going to be available during the Maryland campaign, where he was more grievously wounded, fighting in the West Woods, north of Sharpsburg, Maryland, during the Battle of Antietam. It would take him a long time for him to recover from that, and he would never go back to his division ever again. When he returned to the Army of the Potomac after the Battle of Fredericksburg, he was a major general and well on his way to becoming a corps commander. So what corps do they give him? The Ninth Corps. Burnside's Corps. But Ninth Corps wasn't really a big part of the culture of the Army of the Potomac. And Cedric was very much of the culture of the Army of the Potomac. And he was quickly shifted from Ninth Corps to the United States Sixth. <coughs> February 5th, 1863, he became the full-time commander of the U.S. Sixth Corps. February 5th, 1863. It's not that important or significant a date. Nothing momentous changes on that date. But now we are here today. <coughs> and this is the anniversary of 1864. And this is May. This is just a little over a year after he became a corps commander. But to tell you about the attrition of this war, he is now the longest tenured corps commander in the Army of the Potomac. So he is the stalwart. He is the bastion and the bulwark of the Army of the Potomac's solidarity in May of 1864. He was a man who had a brilliant ability as a commander. His men trusted him, loved him. They called him Uncle John and meant it with true affinity. Uh, he had an ability, according to one of the staff officers, to make all depression go away and make all the spasms of your muscles ease instantly just with a smile. He had an uncanny ability to know every officer by sight and know their names. Whether you were the commander of a brigade, division, or a regiment, or a company, they would be able to address you by name, Frank, and ask you for a progress report on your men. He made it a point on the march to never set up his tent once until all the rest of the six quartets were set up first. The men knew that he cared about them first as a priority. And they responded very, very positively. By 1864, this is one of the largest corps in the army. And they believed in their corps commander and would follow him anyway. As we come into the fighting at the wilderness, General Cedric was almost killed at the outset. He walked right into a skirmish fire on May 5th, 1864, a fire that hit at such abrupt point blank range. It missed the general, but blew the head off the staff officer immediately behind him. And he lived to tell about it. The next day, May 6th, 1864, Gordon's flank attack. And General Sedgwick was almost captured because he was in the forefront of battle yet again. As one Confederate officer approached him on horseback and demanded that he surrender, and the other Union soldier stepped between them and shot the Confederate. Cedric was able to escape quite another day. It is now three days later. And in the process, we have moved to Spotsylvania. May 8th, yesterday, was the Battle of Laurel Hill. The expanse out in front of us. The Confederate line out on the distant tree line. In the course of fighting, the 5th Corps became extremely disorganized. The 6th Corps had to come and solidify their line. It was purely a defensive rather than an offensive operation. If you ever see a map of May 8th along this line, it will be a dead giveaway because the troops are hopelessly intermixed on our little ridge here. And they literally go unit by unit, 5th Corps, 6th Corps, 5th Corps, 6th Corps, 5th Corps, 6th Corps. So who's in charge? Is it the Union 5th Corps Commander, Governor Kimball Warren? Or is it the Union 6th Corps Commander, John Sedgwick? By seniority, Sedgwick. But by experience, the person who's been on the ground longest and understands it, Warren. And they bickered between each other over who should come in. The irony being, neither one of them wanted to be the commander at this particular juncture. <laughs> they appealed to General George Meade, 
The Meade's answer was unsatisfactory. They needed to cooperate, he said. To which Warren answered, I'll be damned if I cooperate with Cedric. Cedric will be damned if he cooperates with me. Either I'm in charge or he is in charge. At the end of the day, mousishly, they cooperate. Now it's the next morning. It is May 9th. We have resigned ourselves that we are going to be here for quite some time. At this moment, General Cedric is trying to extract his troops from the 5th Corps troops. All 5th Corps troops going to that side of the road, all 6th Corps troops to this side. In the process of crossing back and forth across this road, they're drawing attention. And there are Confederate skirmishers and sharpshooters out on that middle ridge that pepper this place quite frequently. In the process, one brigade led by a general named William Grove Morris hesitates and stops here briefly. General Morris, about 30 minutes ago, was shot through the thigh and carted away from this spot. Three other members of his brigade were shot in our immediate vicinity within the last half hour. Cedric is about 50 feet behind you with his headquarters. He is having breakfast in his shirt sleeves when one of General George or General Grant's staff officers, Fred Dent, shows up, another West Pointer. And immediately, Cedric makes him welcome. He greets him by his West Point nickname. He says, good morning, Jerry. Have you had breakfast yet? To which Dent answered, the general sent me away before I could have my breakfast, but he promised that it would be good and cold when I got back. <laughs> to which Cedric said, why don't you have breakfast with me? And they shared a cup of coffee. But in the process of sitting 50 feet behind us, and this area being peppered, Dent decided that he wasn't going to linger past the cup of coffee. As he got up, he said, General, you need to move your headquarters for the benefit of your visitors. This is too dangerous a place to be. Please be careful, sir. They shook hands, and as Dent rode away, the last thing he saw was Cedric putting on his coat and walking towards this spot. In fact, Cedric has been sitting at his tent, having breakfast, watching men ducking and dodging, coming past this spot. And he started to laugh. He found it amusing that they would duck and dodge from single bullets. So, as he told Dent, they couldn't hit a barn from that distance. And he was going to straighten things out. As he walked up here, he saw members of the 14th New Jersey Infantry ducking and dodging. In fact, one bullet came very close to the general, and the man immediately in front of him dropped to a knee to take a little bit of cover, to which Cedric looked at him and started to laugh. He said, for shame, for shame, you're ducking and dodging from single bullets. What will you do when they mass their fire? They couldn't hit an elephant from that distance. For shame. In fact, he towed the man just a little bit with his boot to give him a bit of a job. And the man stood up and moved for safer cover. The Cedric was sitting here among two cannons, setting up. He was talking with one staff officer, his de facto chief of staff, Colonel Martin McMahon. Or McMahon. As more units come through here or more elements of the 14th New Jersey come by, again, it draws fire. There's ducking and dodging. The general decided to repeat his performance. He stood up and announced they couldn't hit an elephant from that distance. And the last syllable was clipped. The general abruptly turned around to face McMahon with a quizzical look on his face and then collapsed into his arms. A bullet had struck the general right below the cheekbone on the left-hand side of his face and drilled up through his skull. He was dead before he hit the ground. As he lay on the ground, staff officers try to gather around him as fast as they can. And then took out a handkerchief and put it across the wound, trying to stem the bleeding. A doctor was quickly brought out here. And as Dr. Bauer looked at him, he poured an entire canteen over the wound, trying to wash it out to see exactly what it looks like. 
but the blood just starts spurting and bubbling out. And the general was beyond help. They quickly pick up his limp body and carried it back into the woods, telling all the soldiers around here he's only wounded. They don't tell him anything more. What I want to share with you is one officer who witnessed that and how he wrote about it. I will warn you, this is a little graphic, so if you guys don't want to hear this. Lieutenant John G. Fisher, 14th New Jersey. In a few moments, the general was hit just under the left cheekbone and near the left side of the nose. I was looking at him at the time and saw and heard the bullet strike him. He fell flat on his back among the undergrowth, and as he struck the ground, the blood spurted from the wound at least a foot and a half and saturated the bushes. The staff officer with him knelt at his side and placed his handkerchief on, over the wound. But it was too late. Fisher goes on to say, The general was picked up and carried through the woods to the rear. And one of our men crawled to the spot and came back with his hat. And another got his riding whip. An orderly soon came after and took both of these away with him. And as I was sitting, looking at the spot where he fell, I could see the blood trickling from leaf to leaf through the brush where his head hit the ground. That's a lot of detail. Keep in mind, this is written by an officer in the 14th New Jersey. These men are veterans. They've been in numerous battles. They have seen death now on a daily level, on a scale. It is beyond our comprehension. And yet, this man gives us infinite detail about the death of one individual. That's how much John Cedric means. In fact, he's going to have a profound impact on everybody. By the time Fred Dent got back to General Grant's headquarters, not 20 minutes had lapsed. This is that front. This is the time right now and Cedric has fallen. His body is hard to pass. Fred Dent is going to meet with General Grant, who's standing in the middle of the road, which is an unusual place for the general to be. As Dent comes up to him, he says that the general had a terrible, mournful look on his face. And assuming that Dent already knew, he said, Well, old Cedric is no more. To which Dent was horrified. He said, what do you mean? I was not with him just 20 minutes ago. According to Dent, he said, I have never seen the general so badly affected by anyone or anything except one other time when we were in Burlington, New Jersey. And word was arrived about the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Those were the only two times he ever saw him deeply affected by the loss of George Gordon Meade was also badly affected by this. Because yesterday, May 8th, he told the 6th Corps and the 5th Corps to cooperate. They gave them a hard time about it. Now Cedric's body being carted back to Meade's headquarters. Meade turned to one of his staff officers, a named Theodore Lyman, and said, I feel particularly grieved by this because we did not part. Meade would do everything he could for that body. He had a bomber immediately take care of this body this morning, 150 years ago, using arsenic salt until they could get it to one of the major cities. Uh, they erected a rather crude or rude bier and put uh, limbs over top of it for shade. They had two zouaves of the headquarters guard, the 114th Pennsylvania, Stand over the body with weapons reversed in salute. And throughout the day, officers would leave the front just to say goodbye to Cedric's body. Many of them left this spot crying, deeply affected. Tomorrow, Cedric's body would start on its long trip home. 
It would be taken from here to Fredericksburg by a major named Charles A. Whittier and two other staff officers. There, they will be transported up to Washington, D.C. A thorough embalming will be done in the general's body there on May 11th. And then they start towards Connecticut. They stopped in New York and were there on May 12th at the height of the bloody angle fighting here. And Cedric's body became a stir in New York City. They lay in state for two days. People came to see this man, to see his body. On the 13th, the governor of Connecticut, Benny Burley, came and escorted the body home. They took it to Cornwall Hollow, where Cedric's family was from. There, the governor and the state wanted to put on a dramatic, huge, immense military funeral to honor its greatest fallen hero. And yet Cedric's family begged off and just wanted to keep it quiet and respectful and just to the family and friends. They sent the governor home. They sent the bands home. They sent the military escort home. In Cornwall Hollow, on May 15th, Sedgwick's funeral was done by Sedgwick's own minister in that little town. There were 2,000 people who attended it anyway. And then he was carted across the road from the church, buried in the churchyard, not a half mile from where John Sedgwick was born. He was buried on May 15th. 1864, precisely on the first year's anniversary of the burial of another great officer, Stonewall Jackson. 